Hi guys, uh, so uh, my name is Hannah Tyrrell, I'm an uh, Irish Women's Rugby International, I play with the 15s and the 7s team and uh, I'm just going to give you a bit, of, uh, a bit of background into how I got where I am today. Uh, so I began playing sport when, when I was just a youngster, I started playing with the boys soccer team when I was about 6 or 7 and absolutely loved it, became sport mad, you know, was all I did, I was, I was a big tomboy. And um, when I was about 12, I was told that I couldn't play soccer with the boys anymore because they were getting bigger and, and stronger and faster than me. And it was, it was dangerous for me to, to keep playing with them. So um, I, I turned to GAA instead when I started secondary school. And um, it, it was something I fell in love with immediately. And um, I got picked for the Dublin team uh, playing football. I was a goalkeeper and I ended up playing with them for about 10 years. Uh, I won five All-Irelands uh, during that time. Uh, we were a very successful team. I was very lucky to be uh, part of that team. Uh, when I was 23, about three years ago, I, I picked up rugby for the first time. Uh, a friend of mine who, who I played Gaelic football with, she, uh, she invited me to come down. She thought I'd be very good at it. I, I didn't really know. I'd never played a contact sport before and I, I was a bit nervous, you know. I felt a lot of that anxiety that was talked about beforehand. Um, but, you know, I gave it a go and, and as with all the other sports I tried before, again, I fell in love with it. And I played at my club, Old Belvedere, just, just across the road here, um, for about six months. And I was called into the Irish women's uh, seven scene for a trial. And I'd only played 15s at this point. I didn't really know, know much about sevens. I didn't realise we had a national team. I, I didn't know much about sport at all. Uh, for those of you who don't know, sevens is very similar to 15s in that it's full contact rugby and in full size pitch. Instead of 15 players, you have seven. And uh, you have three forwards, a half back, and, and three backs. Instead of playing one game of 80 minutes uh, each weekend, you play six games of 14 minutes over, uh, over a tournament over the course of two days. It's tough going, it's very intense. It's, uh, you know, players who play tend to have to be very fit, have to be very fast, have to be very strong. And their core skills have to be excellent because there's so much um, intensity in it and so much responsibility on each individual player. So we play, uh, Ireland play on a, a World Series team, uh, a league, and we travel all around the world. We very rarely get to play at home. And uh, some of the countries that I'll be visiting this year, hopefully, will be, um, we'll be going to Dubai and uh, Sydney. We'll be hitting up France, Russia, Canada. Uh, we'll be going to Vegas, Japan. And, and uh, you know, it's a turn where we travel all across the world, and it's something that um, you know is it, grown in sport. For the first time, we we took part in the uh, Rio Olympics. Uh, rugby was there. Unfortunately, Ireland didn't qualify. Uh, but for me, that's my everyday job. I get to go in to a professional environment and uh, train at a very high standard with all the facilities uh, available to me. And uh, I also play with the 15s team. And back in 2015, I made it onto the Six Nations squad for the first time. And uh, you know, I was very lucky to be to be part of that squad because women's rugby has been growing so much. And you know, um, we've been having a lot of success in, in the past couple of years. And I was very fortunate that we won the Six Nations that year, my first season. Um, and uh, unfortunately, I got a really bad injury, a uh, shoulder injury. I dislocated my shoulder in the last game of that and I ended up having reconstructive surgery and I was out for about a year with that uh, but thankfully I'm back playing and hopefully we'll be taking part in the Women's World Cup next year which is happening right here in Dublin right across in UCD and um, for me though while sport was always going so well for me personally I was struggling with a lot of things uh, through my teenage years back when I was about 12 or 13 uh, I had really low self-belief low self-confidence and um, felt really worthless I didn't think I was good enough, I didn't think I was good enough in school, didn't think I was good enough at sport, didn't think I was a good enough friend or good enough daughter. And, um, you know, I, I had a lot of neg negative feelings towards myself. Uh, I felt like if I could change how I looked, uh, I could change maybe how I feel, I could change how people thought about me or, or they might like me more. And so I ended up developing an eating disorder in the form of bulimia. Um, and I began to, you know, count calories and restrict my food intake and uh, start fasting, skipping meals and, and vomiting after meals. And um, from that, I also began to self-harm. And, and for me, the self-harm was a form of punishment for everything that I, I thought I was doing wrong. And, you know, if I felt like I, I played poorly in a match or I didn't get the grades that I wanted in school, um, 
I had all this negative emotions inside me and the anger and the frustration and the shame and guilt would build up inside me and I, I didn't know how to communicate that to people. Uh, I, I was never really good at communicating how I felt and so I internalized everything and let those emotions grow inside me. And the only way that I felt like I could release these emotions was through self-harm. And when I self-harmed, I got this huge sense of relief, you know, and I, I instantly felt better. But eventually, after a couple of hours, uh, those, those negative feelings would return again, I would feel crappy. And I got stuck in this cycle of self-harm uh, and my bulimia as well. And this continued for a very long time. And, and I was very good at hiding from my friends and family. And nobody knew that I, was, that I was going through any of this. I kept it completely secret. I withdrew from all my friends and family and I, I stopped going out and I just stood in my room and completely isolated myself which actually made things worse because again everything else was just bottled up inside me and the negativity began to grow and for me you know this continued all throughout my, my teenage years and it wasn't until I was about 17 or 18 when things began to get progressively worse and my, my eating sort of my bulimia became much worse, my, my self-harm became much more serious to the point where I was needing uh, medical attention. Uh, I was doing it more frequently. And still nobody had a clue what was going on. And it wasn't until a, a failed suicide attempt when I was 18 um, that actually people started to notice something was up with me and I wasn't this bright and bubbly girl that, that I had portrayed on the outside. Um, I was referred to Pieta House, uh, a, a charity organization for the prevention of suicide and self-harm. and. The counsellors there were fantastic for me, um, but I was very stubborn at the time and I didn't think I was sick enough or I didn't think that I deserved the help that they were offering. And things came to a stage where I was actually admitted into a mental um, hospital of St. Patrick's over in Dublin where I spent six months in there uh, trying to address my problems of self-harm and uh, bulimia. And I came out of um, that hospital and I wasn't cured because I wasn't ready, like there, if there is such a thing as being cured. but. I wasn't ready. I wasn't ready myself to believe that I deserved to get better. And so my self-harm and bulimia continued for, for a few years after that. And um, through all of this, sport was probably the one thing that, that I kept constant in my life and that, that didn't change or that I didn't withdraw from. And it was the one or two hours a day where I could actually just go and forget about all the negativity that, that was going on in my head. And I wasn't exercising to burn calories or, or lose weight. I was doing it because I loved the sport and I enjoyed doing it. And I made a lot of friends uh, through Club and County when I, when I was playing the sports uh, through my teenage years. And it was these friends, you know, that really stuck with me uh, all the way up. And even though a lot of them didn't realize what was going on, they like, you know, for me, they were a big step in me actually reaching out and asking for help when I did figure out that I needed it. Um, and that came when I was about 23. And um, I, I was sick and tired of what I was going through. You know, it was 10 or 11 years that I was struggling with my mental health and every day was such a battle. And again, trying to hide it from everybody was just so tiring, it was so draining. And I had this through my friends and family, like, you know, who were there for me and did support me. And I just didn't reach out enough. Through them, I, I began to gain this self-belief and this self-confidence and, you know, and that I did deserve to be happy and I did deserve you know, to get the help that I needed. And uh, this self-belief began to grow. And so I began to reach out and, and talk to my friends. And, and once I did, the relief was immense. I always felt like I would be a burden if I reached out and help or that people wouldn't care. Like, and they'd be like, oh, this one's gone on again and moaning about something that's not there. Um, but the first time that I really reached out to my friends and said, look, I'm not really feeling great today. And, you know, can I come over? and and of course, they were completely supportive. And, and what happened that day, actually, is I went over, we sat on, on my friend's couch, and we didn't say a word, and we just watched TV for a couple of hours. And it, that was all I needed. Like, I didn't need this big intervention or this cure or my friend to do something significant. I just needed company at that time. And, and every time I reached out, I received support like this, and that made my confidence grow more to reach out again. And the more I spoke, the more relieved I became, and the better I began to feel. And it was these baby steps, you know, that really put me on the path to recovery. Um, and it, it took a couple of years, like I, I had a couple of backward steps in that time. But, um, you know, three years later, like I'm 26 now, and I'm very proud to be able to say that I'm, I'm very happy and very healthy and fully recovered from my self-harm and my eating disorder. 
Um, and I'm very privileged to be able to share my story uh, in the hope that people out there can, who might be struggling with their mental health um, realise that they're not alone in what they're going through uh, and that no matter how, how bad you're feeling or no matter how broken you think you are, that there is light at the end of the tunnel and there is help out there for everybody and that we can all um, you know, feel better about ourselves. And I think the biggest thing to take from this, if you can, is that communication is key. If you don't reach out and talk to somebody, they can't, they can't know that you're struggling with something. So, um, you know, just reach out, ask someone how they're doing or tell someone that you're not feeling well. I, I guarantee you that you'll immediately feel better and it will put you on that right path to uh, your mental health just being that little bit better for that day. Uh, so thank you for allowing me to share my story with you guys.